The easiest and least expensive fabric for beginners to work with is a plain weave fabric made of cotton fiber. Just to be clear, cotton is not a fabric. Cotton is a fiber that comes from a plant. Once the cotton plant has matured, the cotton fibers are removed from the plant. Those cotton fibers are then processed into yarn, which is then woven into a fabric. For this lesson, we won't be going very deep into textiles. I'm just going to discuss the fabric and its properties. When more advanced properties of fabrics are required, those will be discussed at that time. The fabric I'm going to be using, as I mentioned before, will be the least expensive and easiest fabric for beginners. This fabric is called muslin. Muslin is a very basic fabric, most commonly made of cotton and is woven with the plain weave process. The plain weave process is when two yarns are woven perpendicular to each other and alternate running over and under at every other interval, interlocking each other. So if I can demonstrate that using this loom, there are a couple properties that you'll need to understand uh, when you're working with fabric and two of them are the straight grain and the cross grain. Now the straight grain is also known as the warp and the cross grain is known as the weft or sometimes called the filling. In this demonstration we're going to look here first we're going to identify the straight grain or the warp as the white yarns and the cross grain will be this red color. So when we look at the yarns, when the yarns are going across in the cross grain or in the filling, it is going to run under and over as seen here. And I'm going to use this stick to identify how that happens. So I'm going to select every other yarn. And then what would happen is the yarn passes through the middle. And when I release this, the yarns are locked and I can bring this yarn back down. And of course, that's not as, as tight as it would be woven, but that's an example. Now here at the edges, the yarn is gonna loop under and then back over. And I will use this stick again and grab every other yarn and so on. And the yarn would then be passed through that section and then the yarns would be tightened up to the top. So this process, what happens here on the sides is that it automatically finishes here on the side and the side is called the selvage. So now we have a few of the properties of all fabric that you're gonna to need to understand. And this is the straight grain and the cross grain. Again, in the industry, the straight grain is known as the warp and the cross grain is known as the weft. And then I also mentioned here, on each of the sides of the fabric, you will have the selvage. And the selvage edges basically are defined as self-finished edges, which all fabric will have. Now, if we have a look here at the fabric, I and mean, this is the muslin, I have on this side the selvage here, which is self-finished, it's not unraveling, and then I have the other side of it, which is also self-finished, another selvage. And then of course between it we have the, the cross grain yarns and then the straight grain yarns. And you can see here I've ripped the edges, which we'll get to in preparing. All of these yarns kind of come out very easily on this ripped edge. These are all the cross grain or weft yarns. So it should be noted that between your selvages, all of the fabric between the selvages is actually the usable part of the fabric. So when we talk about the usable part of the fabric in the projects, we're not going to be adding on the selvage and we very rarely will use the selvage. There are some designer labels that actually use the selvage in finishing an edge, or we've heard of selvage edge denim um, when they are making pants. So um, just understand that when we're working on our projects, we're gonna ignore the selvage and we're gonna actually minus that part from the actual width of the fabric. So for instance, if this were 44 inch fabric, that measurement would be from selvage to selvage, 
and if it's 44 inches, we're going to subtract this half inch of the selvage on either size, side, so the usable portion of the fabric would be 43 inches. There is another property of fabric that you need to understand, and that's what we call the bias. And again, just to cover again, I have the cross grain, I have the straight grain, and I have the selvage. And between the selvage and the perpendicular cross grains, we have the bias. And the bias is any angle between the cross grain and the selvage in that perpendicular area. The true bias is a 45 degree angle at that corner. So the bias runs diagonally across the fabric. And the bias is actually the most stretchy part of the fabric. You can see that I can stretch quite a bit here. Whereas the cross grain will stretch a little bit and the straight grain will usually not stretch any. So the bias is very important, a lot of designer Gowns are made cut on the bias. They have to hang for a certain amount of time to get all of the stretch out and then they are hemmed. That's kind of an ad advanced process at this point. But I want you to understand the different areas of the fabric. Now again, my cross grain runs perpendicular to the straight grain and my selvage runs parallel to the straight grain. And then the bias is any angle between the perpendicular area of the selvage and the cross grain. And the true bias runs 45 degree angle. Why are these properties so important? Understanding the properties of fabrics relates directly to the patterns you'll be using. All of the patterns that you'll be using will have information on them that contains the name of the pattern or style number. It will also have the fabric code you will use in relationship to the pattern piece and the garment. It usually will not have a specific type of fabric. For instance, if there is a main fabric or if the fabric is made completely of the same fabric, that fabric will be called self. If the garment is made of two or more types of fabric, then the fabric that, he, that is used the most will be called self, and the other fabrics will be called contrast. For multiple contrast fabrics, they will be called contrast one, contrast two, contrast three, and so on. There will also be cut amounts for the number of times the pattern piece needs to be cut. On commercial patterns for home use, if a piece needs to be cut twice, it will just say cut two, but doesn't say whether or not the pattern piece needs to be flipped over for a left and a right. The reason for this is because at home patterns rely on folding the fabric in half, in which you would automatically have two different pieces that would be reflecting each other to create a left and a right. However, in the fashion apparel production environment, fabric is not folded, so the cut amount is written a bit differently. If there was a left and a right to be cut, the cut amount would read cut one pair. By using the word pair, the marker maker or cutter knows that there needs to be a left and a right piece, so the one pattern will need to be flipped over to cut for the opposite piece. In today's computer world, this will be a setting that the pattern maker or marker maker will input into the computer and the flip will happen automatically when the marker is printed. In production, if there is no indication that a pattern is a pair or needs to be flipped, yet still says cut two, two of the same exact pattern pieces will be cut. There is other information on the pattern piece, such as the pattern piece name itself. Here it says right front, but you would also see a back or a sleeve or any other pattern piece specific to that garment. And there will also be notches that will need to be clipped out around the perimeter of the pattern, which help matching different pieces and sewing. These are industry standard slit notches, while in the commercial patterns you'll see here are triangles that will need to be clipped into. Notches are very important, so don't forget to clip the notches. Notches tell you how the garment should be sewn. Notches are also used for controlling gathers, pleats, darts, and tucks, and so many other design details. You'll become more aware of notches and their uses as we experience them in the exercises and projects. Now, for the most important marking on the pattern, the grain line. The grain line tells you how to place the pattern piece on the fabric. 
The grain line usually runs the full length of the pattern and has arrows on both ends, such as this one. Some pattern pieces have an arrow only at one end. This means that the pattern piece can only be laid in one direction in relationship to the weave of the fabric. Okay, so now the really important part about the grain line. So imagine that I'm speaking with all caps on when I say this. The grain line on the pattern piece must be laid in the same direction as the straight grain of the fabric. Or I could say it a different way. The grain line on the pattern piece must be parallel to the selvage of the fabric. It doesn't matter what the pattern piece looks like, the grain line on that pattern piece must always follow these rules. The same direction as the straight grain of the fabric, which is also parallel to the selvage. So what if you don't have a selvage to align your grain line to? It can happen. Sometimes the selvage will have been ripped off or you're using a smaller piece of scrap fabric. For whatever reason, there is not a selvage to help you lay your pattern piece down. There are ways to find the straight grain. So as mentioned before, the straight grain runs the length of the fabric and those yarns are the foundation and they're usually a high number of yarns between the selvages. The cross grain is usually less dense than the straight grain yarns, which allows the cross grain to give or slightly stretch. So look closely at your fabric and at the yarns in the weave, and notice the perpendicular pattern that the yarns make. Now, using both hands, pull the fabric side to side in the direction of one of those yarns. Make sure you're doing it in the perpendicular manner. If the fabric does not give or slightly stretch, that is the straight grain. If you're pulling and you get a slight stretch going across and you feel like it gives, that is most likely the cross grain. But make sure when you do this that you're not pulling on the bias, which is at an angle which stretches much further. That is not perpendicular. There is another way to tell, but it is difficult to do this on camera, but I'll try to explain. Identify your perpendicular yarns. You'll need to take the fabric in both hands at least six inches apart and then quickly tug several times to produce a sound. In one direction, the sound that is produced is high pitched and in the other direction is low pitched. The high pitched direction is the straight grain. So let me demonstrate. Low pitched, high pitched. Now you have two methods to find the straight grain. Fabric weight is another attribute you will need to consider. Lightweight, medium weight, and heavy weight. Lightweight fabrics like chiffon or this voile have a very loose and open weave, meaning you can see through it and it drapes very softly. Medium weight is a more densely and tighter woven fabric, such as this muslin, which I'm going to be using in all of the projects. But there are many other types of medium weight fabrics, such as this quilter's cotton. And then there's also linen. Heavyweight fabrics tend to be very crisp. They don't drape very well and are much more dense and tend to be very tightly woven. The yarns to produce the weave are most times larger than light and medium weight fabrics. Some heavyweight fabrics you may identify quickly are denim, which is a type of twill, and canvas. You may also hear others say top weight or bottom weight. Top weight refers to garments worn above the waist, and bottom weight refers to garments worn at or below the waist. A top weight fabric would be a light to medium weight, while a bottom weight would be more of a medium to a heavy weight. Of course, these are not hard and fast rules. It will also depend on the fabric weave. Fabrics are a great source of inspiration for designers. Experiment with different types of fabrics and weights to gain a greater understanding of how fabrics work. You'll need to prepare your fabric before cutting. If the project will need to be washed, I would suggest washing the fabric prior to use. I wouldn't want you to spend hours making a garment that you won't be able to wear after you wash it. Wash and dry the fabrics as you would if it were a garment already made. You'll need to press the fabric after you remove it from the dryer. Try to iron in the direction of the straight grain. This will help realign the yarns that have gotten out of place while being washed.
Once the fabric has been ironed, you will need to realign the grain of the fabric. The nice thing about working with cotton is that it, it is easy to realign the grain line. You will need to establish a clean edge across the cross grain. Remember that our fibers, our straight grain and our cross grain run perpendicular to each other. So using your scissors on both edges, clip into the selvage about an inch below the cut edge, clip in, and then you'll need to pull and rip the fabric straight across that line. Do this on both edges of your fabric. If you look closely, you can see the individual cross grain yarns that pull out easy. These reveal the straight grain yarns. This, fa this gives the fabric a good edge to work with. Using this edge as a balance, check to see that the selvages are running perfectly perpendicular to that edge. If you have a cutting mat that has a grid like this one here, you can line up the edge with one of those lines to check for the perpendicular selvages. So now, using the grid, line up the selvage on one of those lines to check to see if your cross grain is running perpendicular. Here, it's not. If your edges are not perpendicular, the fabric is off grain and needs to be reset. Stretch the fabric in the opposite direction along the bias. Stretching the fabric this way pulls the yarns back to the original position, and you'll want to do this until the selvages are perpendicular to the ripped edge. I'm already a lot closer, so I'm just going to continue to pull down and sometimes wiggle and try to get those yarns to go right back to their perpendicular position. Much closer. Let's pull that a couple more times. And that's the idea. So now, my cross grain is now perpendicular to my selvage. So what happens if you don't realign your off grain fabric? Well, have you ever had a pant leg twist around your ankle? Or what about a shirt that always twisted to one side? That's what happens when the fabric is cut off grain. When considering the fabrics you will use, you will also need to take into consideration the interfacing that will be required for the product you're making. In the apparel production environment, you'll hear people refer to it as interlining. Interfacing is a specialty fabric that stabilizes certain areas of the product while sewing, such as zippers, hems, facings, and areas that have a lot of details. Choosing the appropriate interfacing for your product is as important as the main fabric of your garment. Don't skip on the interfacing. There are several types of interfacing, but I'm only going to discuss a few. There are woven and knit interfacing. These two types come in two variations, sew-in and fusible. Sew-in interfacing is applied exactly as it sounds. It must be sewn into the area where the product needs stabilizing or structure. Fusible has a glue on one side and is applied using an iron to get it to stick to the fabric. When choosing the correct interfacing, keep in mind that you want the interfacing to be about the same weight as the fabric or lighter. There are exceptions to this rule, such as when you want a shirt collar or cuff to be very stiff. Then you choose a heavy stiff interfacing. If you're unsure about the weight to buy, purchase a much lighter weight interfacing than your fabric. This will enable you to layer the interfacing if you decide you need a stiffer appearance. An additional consideration is how you would prefer to apply the interfacing, either by sewing it in or by fusing it to the fabric. Fusible will of course take much less time than sew-in. If you choose sew-in, you will need to sew it to the wrong side of the fabric, then trim the seam allowance of the interfacing to 1 8 of an inch from the stitch line. I prefer using a fusible interfacing, specifically this type of interfacing. Pellon EK130 Easy Knit Fusible Interfacing. This is a fusible knit interfacing. The reason I like this interfacing is that it is lightweight, has a wonderful drape, and is fusible. The best thing about this interfacing is that it is very easy to build up by fusing additional pieces on top of each other while maintaining its drape and softness.
Although this is a knit, it can be used on woven fabrics with great success. This is usually the only type of interfacing I buy, and it's great because I can use it on both woven and knit fabrics. It is expensive, but well worth it. I would suggest buying this when you purchase your fabric. There is one more thing about interfacings I would like to mention. Interfacings really play an important role in clothing construction. However, you, the designer, must decide what level of sewing you want to perform. For instance, if you want to sew haute couture or designer ca category styles, you would only use high quality sew-in interfacings. Using fusible interfacings are mainly used in mass-produced apparel in the ready-to-wear category and below. Understand, though, that if you are doing personal sewing for clients, you'll need to consider the style of garment your customer is wanting and the price point they are willing to spend with you. As I mentioned at the beginning of this section, muslin is the least expensive fabric for beginners to use. It's made from cotton, which is a fiber, not a fabric. However, muslin is typically not a very attractive fabric. As a suggestion for your projects, use only fabrics made of cotton. Try to avoid anything blended with polyester or nylon. These fabrics tend to stretch, and as a beginner, you will appreciate a more stable fabric. If you're unsure when you're at the fabric store or shopping online, quilter's cotton is always a safe choice. Remember, cotton shrinks. Always buy extra fabric if you are making clothing. I usually buy an extra quarter yard. Before you head out to the fabric store, sit down with the pattern and make a list of all the supplies you'll need. If you plan on looking through the pattern books at the store, bring along a notepad and a pencil so you can jot down the items you will need once you decide on a pattern. Things you would need to consider, the main fabric, lining, interfacing, thread, buttons, drawstrings, elastic, etc. You may not need all of these items to your product, but I wanted to mention the most common so you get the idea. I cannot stress enough that planning out your sewing project beforehand leads to much less stress along the way. Don't purchase buttons after you make the shirt. Purchase them at the time you purchase the fabric. Don't purchase the drawstring or elastic after you've made the pant. Buy everything at the same time. Here's a hypothetical situation. You just finished that shirt you've been working tirelessly on, but you can't wear it tomorrow because you didn't buy the buttons the same time you bought the fabric. And now you'll have to wait until you have the time to go back to the fabric store to purchase buttons. How long will that be before that happens? I think you get the idea. Now that you have learned identifying fabric properties, basic pattern piece information, and how to prepare your fabrics, you're ready to start your project.